The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon and welcome to a webinar hosted by United Charitable Programs. My name is Stephanie Lanham and I'll be today's moderator. I will be introducing our presenter as well as reading off any questions that you may have at the end of the presentation. As you may be aware, this webinar will guide you on how to request payments, donations, and reimbursements as an active charitable program under UCP. But before we get started, I'd like to go over a few webinar housekeeping items. First, I just want to make sure that everyone can indeed hear me. If you can look on your control panel right there and just click on that um, hand icon. If we can get all attendees to raise their hand using the hand icon. Okay, great. So all attendees at this webinar will be muted. If you have any questions, simply type them into the comment field located on the control panel to the right of your screen. Then all que que questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. All right, so let's get started. How to request payments, reimbursements, and donations. A guide to using the disbursement request form. Today's presentation will be given by Katie Kern, the Director of Program Administration here at UCP. So now let's welcome Katie. Hi everyone. Like Stephanie said, my name is Katie. I'm the Director of Program Administration. <clears throat> I'm going to be your main contact for any questions or concerns, or perhaps if you need a better understanding of a policy or form, you definitely give me a call or an email, and I'm going to share with you my contact information and my email address at the end of the webinar, so just stay, stay tuned. And like Stephanie said, we are going to talk about the disbursement request form today. Here's a quick overview of the things that we're going to touch on. UCP in your program, the disbursement request form, the activity code, taxable income for services, donations with a sneak preview just for you guys, of the charitable gift recommendation form. It's a new form that we're coming out with that as it relates only to charitable donations so both overseas and in the United States. And then the final thing that we're going to talk about is the submission of the disbursement request form and any processing and delivery options that are available to you. But before we get started, I always like to take a moment to remind everyone that we do have a program operations manual and if you have not yet done so, we do require that a fiscal sponsorship agreement is on file as signed by you, the program manager, with us before you begin program op uh, operations. Excuse me. And also a quick reminder, we did have our annual report deadline. That was on May 1st. So if you haven't sent that in, please do so. We've already begun processing them. And we will go through rounds of closing programs that have not yet responded. But if you have any questions or concerns, or if you need a little bit more comprehensive explanation of an item in the fiscal sponsorship agreement or even in the program operations manual, we would be happy to help. You can give us a call or shoot us an email. Our staff email address is info at unitedcp.org. And our main number here is 703-536-8708. And all of our forms and policies, including the fiscal sponsorship agreement, the operations manual, and our annual report are available on our website, and that is unitedcp.org or unitedcharitableprograms.org. Here at UCP, we are dedicated to allow our programs to focus on the mission and not the administration. And while sometimes it may seem that our, our policies and uh, procedures are very form-centric, we try and make things as streamlined and as easy as possible for our program managers to handle. And we handle the, the harder stuff, the audit every year, independent audit, the 990 filings, the state filings, the registration. We do that all for our programs as the fiscal sponsor. But there are certain pieces of information that we need to understand about our programs, and one of the major ones are expenses and income. And so today we're going to talk about the disbursement request form as it relates to the expenses of our program. Under UCP's fiscal sponsorship, 
Please always make sure that you state that you're a fiscally sponsored project of UCP. And the correct statement is, the name of your program here is a fiscally sponsored project of United Charitable Program, a registered 501c3 public charity. And then you can provide our TIN, which stands for Tax Identification Number. And that number is 20-428-6082. And you should always remember to use the title Program Manager. Titles such as Director or President or Executive Director are reserved here for our UCP corporate staff. Our program managers can't use those titles. Additionally, our programs are not allowed to open any kind of account, like a bank account or, let's say, a credit card account in the name of the program or in the name of UCP or TIN. And please note that you need to get our express written consent before you use UCP's name or tax ID number. As a fiscal sponsor, we do provide oversight and supervision of all our program's activities. And one of the ways we do that is with that disbursement request form. We handle the donation deposit and acknowledgement sent to donors. And that's for donations of 250 or more, and that's an IRS mandate. For donations under 250, you're welcome to send a sample donation letter template, which is available on our website, or a thank you note that you make yourself. And we handle the IRS and state filings. We have a yearly independent audit. And finally, the disbursements from your program. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Here's a quick overview of how programs work at UCP. A mission is identified by the program manager. Uh, usually it is a grassroots mission, or we have a few programs that are quite large. And the program manager applies with UCP to become fiscally sponsored with us. They, in turn, then go out and seek donations to support that mission. They can be grants, federal grants, state grants, private foundation grants, corporate sponsorships, checks from businesses or vendors, or even individual donations, credit cards, e-checks, all that kind of good stuff, and which is then forwarded to UCP for deposit. UCP then deposits those checks and donations and receives the donors if necessary, and then allocates those funds to that program account. The program then, using the disbursement request form, requests the dispersal of funds to support the program's mission. So it's kind of a, a cycle for our programs, a cycle of life. And here at the star of the show, the disbursement request form. It may seem cumbersome at first, but as soon as you use it a few times, many of our program managers say it gets easier and easier to understand. So if you're looking at it the first time, I can definitely see how you would say it's, it's kind of hard to understand. But that's why we're here. We're here to help. So feel free to give us a call anytime or shoot us an email, and we'd be happy to help in any way that we can. So we're going to touch on all the five major points as indicated on this form. And we're going to first start with, oh, excuse me, I forgot about this, the instruction sheet. We do have an instruction sheet available at our, on our website. It's a condensed version of this webinar, but it does have information about processing and payee information, activity codes, and justification. So you're welcome to take a look at that. Again, it's available at our web website, which is unitedcp.org or unitedcharitableprograms.org, underneath the Forms and Policies tab. So we're first going to start with paying and processing. The very first thing you should do when you start filling out a disbursement request form is indicate your program's name, which is number one, project name, and your account number, which is project number. And those pieces of information help UCP here to make sure that number one, the expenses are related to your program's mission, and number two, that we know which account the funds should be dispersed from. The second area you're going to want to fill out is the payee's name, and that can be an individual, a vendor, a business, a corporation a charitable entity, and you're going to want to give us the entity's address as well. Even if you're going to send the check to a different address, say your, your own address or another individual's address or a separate address altogether, you want to make sure that you give us the address of the entity that we're paying. We do need that for our record. So that's where you're going to indicate right there. Then check to either the payee, the program address on file as it pertains to UCP, or a separate address altogether. You're also going to indicate the total amount requested to be sent to the payee. <clears throat> and that's important because 
a payee can be reimbursed for multiple receipts or paid for multiple invoices. So you want to add all those items up and indicate that they are the total amount requested. And the third area is we do have special processing and delivering options available. Our normal processing uh, time frame is three to five business days. Now, we are going to touch upon the different options for processing and delivery later, but I just wanted to, see, wanted to show everyone where that is on the form. The second area that probably produces the most confusion for our program is the activity code. Now, an activity code is used both internally at UCP and externally for our programs. It gives us an indication of what these programs are spending their funds on. So that information would be present both in our internal file as well as what is what, excuse me, exhibited externally on our 990, which is posted on our website, as well as on various websites like GuideStar or, I believe, Charity Navigator. And that information is used for our, in, our audit, our independent audit every year. And again, that's used internally for that audit process, but then it also is produced externally for your donating public so they can see a very transparent look at what UCP um, entails. And so the number four area <clears throat> is just a listing of the common activity codes. And I say common activity codes because these are the codes that most of our programs use when they send in the disbursement request form. There are a lot more, many, many more, available to you, and each activity code does have a definition and examples of what that may be. And we're going to go into activity codes a little further in a moment, but we do have the definition sheet available on our website. Again, that's unitedcp.org, and it's underneath the Forms and Policies tab. Now, here are the main program activity codes. And when I say program activity codes, these are the codes you're going to use on your everyday program operations. Things like postage, a receipt perhaps from the US Postal Service, or office supplies, maybe some ink from staples, um, animal care. Many of our programs do have animal-based um, caring programs or feeding programs. So that's the code they would use perhaps if they had a bale of hay receipt or a bag of dog food from PetSmart. Construction related costs, that would be an activity code used for, let's say, the building of a well in the Appalachian Mountains, or perhaps the building of a fence around a, a public school. The health insurance and life insurance premium activity codes are used only for programs that have payroll employees. So if you don't have a payroll employee, those codes don't really pertain to you. We do have codes for fees or taxes, perhaps you're paying a fee for your program. Uh, one of the big, it means one of the two biggest expenses that our programs have are media and website and travel expense. And media and website and programming would really be a code you would say pay a web designer for or web hosting. <coughs> Excuse me. And a travel expense would then be Let's say you're taking a mission trip to Kenya. That would be the code you would use to pay for the airfare. We also have event activity codes and fundraiser activity codes. Now, UCP views those two, two, excuse, two events as two different types of things. One is a more of a seminar or a conference where there's mainly education or a meeting aspect to an event. And it relates to the program's purpose. And a fundraiser more is an event where there's fundraising only with a small kind of tie-in of publication, excuse me, educating the public about the program's purpose, but you're mainly raising funds for the program. So and if you're having an event, and again, if you need to have that approved by UCP, uh, our last webinar was a webinar exclusively about the event and fundraising policy and how to hold an event underneath UCP. If you have any questions about holding an event, please take a look at that. It's on our website under the Resources tab. <clears throat> but let's say you're getting a, an expense reimbursed or paid for for an event, you would use these codes. Things like perhaps you're renting a venue, you would use 5610. Or if you're purchasing food for volunteers at the event, you would use 5615. 
We also have 56404 event insurance. And that's important because every event that UCP programs have need to have a general liability insurance. And that's going to protect both UCP and your program from any kind of liability. Here are the fundraising activity codes. And again, a fundraiser is, is mainly how to raise funds for the program. There are aspects where you're educating the public about your program. But for the most part, you're, you're doing the event to hold, to, excuse me, to raise funds, things like galas or 5K runs or golf tournaments. Most of our programs um, are able to hold these types of events to fund, raise for their program, and be able to sustain their program for that year. Some programs even do so well at a golf tournament, they only need to have one of these fundraisers and then are able to fund their program for the entire year. And similar, similar to the operation codes and the event codes, the fundraising codes have things like postage, printing, uh, food and beverage items, promo items. An example would be a promotional item would be, let's say, a cap or a t-shirt or a golf tee or even a golf bag. We would use this code if you're providing that as a promotional item at your fundraising event. We also have fundraising travel, equipment, media, or website. And again, that event insurance activity code. And you're going to, again, always have event insurance covering UCP in your program in case there's any kind of occurrence of liability. Now, for the receipts and re uh, invoices related to the activity codes, <clears throat> they need to be clearly marked. Uh, most individuals don't uh, indicate on the back of the form, excuse me, on the back of the receipt if they met with somebody or if they had dinner with somebody. You want to indicate, let's say that you had a dinner with potential donors. You want to say met with potential donors on the back. Or let's say that you fed some children from the reservation their breakfast or their dinner. You want to indicate this is what you did and why you did it on the receipt. And that helps both you when you're filling out the form and UCP on the end of that when we're providing that information to our auditors. Now, invoices for payment. This is as pertains to independent contractors, and we're going to delve a little deeper into that later. But invoices should contain the following items, hours worked, work performed, date frame, and how the work relates to charitable purpose. And here are some examples of that. Now, these are receipts that were presented to UCP for reimbursement. The individual program manager went out and purchased uh, various items as it relates to their program's mission. The first one is a staples receipt, and they look like they purchased some ink and some toner. And that activity code is 5090. So the program manager indicated on that receipt 5090, so that when it was turned into UCP here, we had a complete understanding of what was purchased and why. Additionally, the USPS is the uh, um, receipt right here. It looks like they purchased postage or, no, I'm sorry, they had a PO box renewal. And that code is five one, excuse me, 5010, and they indicated that on the form, on the receipt. And the second example, on your right-hand side of your screen, the program manager went out and purchased crowns, and this particular program supplies school items like crowns or book bags or shoes even to school-aged children that aren't able to afford them. So in this particular case, they marked it 5160, which is program supplies, and then indicated that these were crowns for the school kids. Here's an example of an invoice for an independent contractor. And again, an independent contractor is someone that's on file with UCP. And uh, an individual that works for the program on a regular basis. So Jane Smith submitted this invoice, and it shows the date frame, the hours that she worked, uh, the dates that she worked, what work was performed, as well as how the work relates to the charitable purpose of the program itself. Now, the, my favorite part of the disbursement request form is how we receive the receipts sometimes. Sometimes we get just a big old bag of receipts that someone stuffs into a Ziploc bag and mails off to us. Uh, but many of our programs kindly organize them in a very efficient manner. And we're going to talk about the different ways to organize their receipts today. 
Typically, you want to group receipts together with uh, the same code. So let's say you have five receipts that all have the same code, 5090, for office expense. If you're mailing them in, perhaps paper clip or staple them together. If you're faxing or emailing those in, perhaps put them all on the same sheet so that we understand that the, all, the, all the receipts presented on that sheet are for 5090 or 5010, what have you. All receipts should be clear and legible. Unfortunately, if we can't read the receipt, or the amount, or what was purchased, we aren't able to reimburse or pay for that item. Again, the amount needs to be clearly shown. The items that were purchased need to be clearly shown as well. Many of our programs are able to get receipts that are very clearly marked saying what they purchased and the price. Sometimes, though, in the more rural areas, you are not able to purchase, or excuse me, receive a receipt that has a clear indication of what was purchased. <clears throat> and in that case, perhaps just on the back of it, on the back of the receipt, you're going to indicate purchased um, five bales of hay or purchased 15 book bags from general store. And the reason why we ask that these things are, are organized and clearly marked is that UCP needs to have a good understanding of what was purchased. Due to the fact that we need to submit that in information to our independent annual audit, as well as use that information for our 990, which is the filing with the IRS. And UCP does file a consolidated 990, which is consolidated for all of our program's expenses. So we use the disbursement request form to kind of streamline that process, both with the submission of disbursements, as well as the, the providing of that information to our auditors, as well as the 990 for the IRS. Some of our programs uh, save a bunch of receipts and then submit them at one time. In that case, you're going to want to use a log for a large reimbursement of expenses. I'm going to show you an example of a log right now. So in this case, the individual had eight receipts that they wanted to submit for reimbursement. They numbered the receipts. They indicated on the receipt the activity code. But in a log, they're showing us, instead of writing on the back of the receipt, the description of what was purchased or why it was purchased and the amount. And the great thing about these kind of logs is that it enables UCP to process your submission much quicker and you're able to get that reimbursement to you in a very, very timely fashion as opposed to some of the programs that just send a, a bag of receipts that we have to go through and take the time to, to understand and, and kind of group into the different activity codes. So when you, as a program manager, are able to send something to UCP that's organized we're able to be more efficient and provide better service to our program managers. The next important thing I want to talk about as it relates to activity codes is taxable income. Now, taxable income can be for a variety of things, mainly it's time or space or rent or services. Now, when a service is provided, UCP requires that we have a W-9 on file. The W-9 is an IRS form that provides to UCP the taxpayer's legal name, their address, and their social security number. And we use that information to pay that individual, as well as report that individual's income to the IRS. If the individual is an independent contractor with the program, there is an independent contractor employment agreement that we need to have on file. And just so you know, our independent contractors do not have a commission-based pay, but rather an hourly wage. And you can see more information about independent contractors on our employment policy or the employment agreement itself. And an invoice is needed for taxable income. Now, an invoice could be for rent. It could be for a web designer. It could be a speaker's fee. There's all kinds of things that people provide services that we would have to pay taxable income to. And please note that UCP has to pay that individual taxable income or vendor taxable income directly. We cannot reimburse our program managers for paying that to individual or vendor taxable income as we need to report that, IR, that income excuse me, to the IRS as well as provide the vendor or individual with a 1099 miscellaneous for their taxes at the end of the year. Another important policy as it pertains to activity codes is our office reimbursement policy. <clears throat> Our programs have two types or two options open to them as it relates to rented space. A program can rent office space outside the home 
or if they have a room 100% dedicated to the program, they can get a percentage of, let's say, their mortgage or their rent reimbursed, excuse me, paid to them as a sublease. They are also able to pay utilities. Now, in the case of an office rented outside the home, we can pay those utilities directly. In the case of an office rent that is inside the home, we can pay that a percentage of those utilities directly to the utility company, or we can include that amount as it paid to the program manager. Programs do typically need to have computers, and if the office is located outside the home, the program can get reimbursed or paid for a computer expense 100%. If the program has rented space inside the home, we can reimburse or pay up to 90% of our computer purchase due to the inherent personal use. For cell phones, many of our program managers use their cell phone to conduct program business or contact donors, contact program participants, contact constituents. So you're able to get reimbursed for a percentage of your cell phone use. In most cases, the program is able to take a one month of their bill and go through and highlight, let's say, the program calls versus the personal calls, and then use that to, in, to uh, determine a percentage that's going to be reimbursed. So an example would be 10 calls out of 100 calls are program related. So that means 10% of the cell phone could be reimbursed to you. And please note that office space, again, is taxable income, so we would need a W-9 from the landlord, and we would send them a 1099 at the end of the year. Another activity code is travel. Uh, it's 5420, and we have programs that travel both inside the United States and outside the United States. And when you're traveling inside the United States, there are a couple of options. There are day trips and multiple day trips. We're going to first talk about multiple day travel. Again, this code is 5420. And you're going to present receipts like cab fare, or a meal, or a hotel, or airfare, or a rental car. And if you're outside the United States, we recommend that you use a travel log. And that travel log indicates what was purchased, why it was purchased, and the amount. And the reason we say that you should do that is sometimes you're not able to get a receipt when you're outside the United States. So this way you're able to keep track of all the expenses as they pertain to the program's mission overseas or the travel overseas. You're also going to want to supply UCP with the foreign currency conversion rate that you use to determine the amount to be reimbursed. And please note that you do want to submit to UCP before the triple travel form, excuse me, approval form, 30 days before you have the event, excuse me, before you have the trip. Now, this slide really talks about day trips in the United States, where you're just going, let's say, down to uh, a venue to give a speech, or let's say you're driving around delivering meals for seniors. You're going to use this particular information. Uh, please note that UCP does not reimburse for gas receipts, and the exception to that is if a rental car is rented, let's say, for a week or for a day or even for a weekend. And we are able to pay the gas receipt as it pertains to the, the rental car and its rented time frame. UCP uses a uh, mileage rate to reimburse the mileage. And that current mileage rate is six, excuse me, 56.5 cents per mile. And that's the 2013 IRS mileage rate. And with day trips, UCP does not need to have pre-approval for that kind of travel. But you are going to want to keep a travel log or a mileage log so that you're able to get reimbursed for that mileage later on. You're going to want to have information like the day you traveled or the purpose. And you're also going to want to have the information about the miles traveled. So at the end of the month, you could submit that form, uh, excuse me, that log, as well as the disperse request form to get reimbursed for the mileage that you drove for your program's UCP approved purpose. Here's a slide about donations to charity. We have a current policy on our website about donations to charity that is going to be updated. And that policy is going to be updated for both US and foreign gifting. 
What you see here is a sneak peek at our tradable gift recommendation form. And this form is going to take the place of the code 5100, which is 5100 donations to U.S. and overseas charities. And this form is going to be used for both our fiscally sponsored projects, our programs like you, and our donor advice funds, which are the other option that we have available at United Charitable Program. You're going to provide information like the EIN or TIN of the organization, as well as information about why the particular program, why the, excuse me, why the particular charity was selected, uh, how it furthers the purpose of your program or the donor advice fund. And the form, uh, this particular form and our policy on U.S. and foreign gifting is going to come out in June. And it's in response to new regulations and restrictions that are placed upon us by OFAC or uh, the executive orders or the legislation or the IRS code. And we have an upcoming webinar on the new forms and the new policy on July 17th. So you are welcome to attend. I highly recommend that the programs that have any kind of overseas gifting or overseas operations attend the webinar to learn about the new policy as well as getting questions answered. And again, you're able to call us or visit our website or get us an email if you have any questions in the meantime about that policy. The final area that we're going to talk about on the dispersion request form is the justification and memo area. Now the justification is important because we use that area for both our internal audit as well as the 990 that we present to the IRS. And the reason why we ask that the program manager fill that area out is those are the questions that an auditor will ask me, and I want to be able to provide an intelligent answer and show why the program purchased this item or how it relates to the program's purpose. So again, you're going to want to answer the questions like, how did expense relate to the program's mission? Where did you go? Who did you meet with? If it's an overseas reimbursement, please provide the exchange rate. And then the final area is the memo line. And that's the information that's placed on the check in the memo area. And that could be anything from an invoice ID or account number, if it's, let's say, a reimbursement that you're paying directly to your credit card. Um, it could be things about when, let's say, a consultant worked. There could be all kinds of information placed on that check right there. And you could just indicate that right there on the form. The last area that you're going to want to print and sign is your the program manager attestation area. Basically, you're certifying that no donors are being reimbursed. As you know, there was a legislation change back in 2006 that really changed how donor advice funds and active charitable programs work. So as an active charitable program or fiscally sponsored program, our program managers are not able to donate, nor are their family members able to donate. And additionally, you're not able to reimburse any kind of donors or let's say an expense or something along those lines. So that attestation area is you just signing that you understand that and you certify that you understand that, as well as that you understand that ECP will review, approve, and process the disbursement form, request form. And the last area that you want to fill out is the email and phone number. Now, we want that contact information even though we may have it on file, or perhaps you have a, a good email that or cell phone number that you want us to call during this workday hours. So we want to be able to contact you. Uh, the easiest and fastest method if we have a question or a concern about an expense or a request form. Now you're going to submit the form and invoices and receipts to us via a variety of ways. The first way is fax. Our fax number is 703-820-5100. You could mail the form and receipts and invoices to us at 6201 Leesburg Pike, Suite 205, Falls Church, Virginia, 22044. And you can email these forms and receipts and invoices directly to a staff member or to the general staff mailbox, which is info at unitedcp.org. <clears throat> and again, you're going to want to include all the necessary receipts and invoices with the dispersion request form. As we touched upon earlier, our normal processing time is three to five business days. 
typically are, right now we're doing about three to four business days, but we do add that additional fifth day just in case there is a lot of submissions at one particular kind, time. But the great thing is that we also offer same day and next day processing. Now, same day and next day processing is just processing. There's no extra delivery method to that. So if you choose same day, you're not going to get it same day unless you choose an additional delivery option. But for same day, there's a $25 fee. And UCP requires that you must send in the submission to us by 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We also have next day processing, which is $10. So let's say you needed something processed tomorrow. You could give it to us by close of business today, and it would be processed tomorrow. Well, let's say you needed the item to be delivered in a very, very fast manner. Uh, we have a couple of options. FedEx, and the cost of that varies depending on where the check will be delivered, as well as the method of delivery. We do have overnight options, two-day mailing, uh, FedEx flexible saver. We also offer priority mail. And the cost for that is $5.60. And it's two to four business days, typically. That's not a guaranteed time frame, but typically our programs receive the check within two to three business days. And we also offer wires. Now, wires for a domestic bank account would be $25. And wires for a foreign bank account would cost $50. But there's information that UCB needs in order to process a wire. And I'm going to show you that right now. This is the domestic international wire form as available on our website, again, unitedcp.org, underneath the forms and policies tab. You're going to provide us information about the account holder's names, their account number, ABA, routing, SWIFT code, all that kind of good stuff that we need in order to process that wire efficiently and correctly. Now you're ready to go. That is the disbursement request form and all the questions that we receive typically along with it. I'd be happy to answer any of your questions right now. Before I let Stephanie take over, I wanted to remind everyone that my name is Katie Kern. I'm the Director of Program Administration here at UCP. My direct number is 703-538-8867. And my email address is Katie, K-A-T-I-E, at unitedcp.org. Stephanie, do you have any questions for us today? Yes, thank you, Katie. It looks like we just have a couple questions here. Um, let me read off the first one for you. If I request a check or payment to be sent to a vendor, how will they know it's from my program and from me? That's a good question. You are able to indicate on the memo line, a, let's say, an account number or an invoice number. But one of the main things that individuals uh, or vendors would know it's from your program is because on the actual check itself, it does say United Charitable Program, but above it, it says your program name. And we are able to mail that check directly to the vendor. So if, let's say you've had an invoice for a number. We could indicate that invoice number there, and it would be applied to that invoice. Or you could mail that check to you, and you could hand deliver it to the vendor. But you, it would also say your program name on it, no matter what method of delivery you chose. And I also have another question that kind of goes with that as well. Is there a letter that accompanies the payment or the check, or, or can my program provide a letter to accompany that check? Yes, uh, your program can provide a letter. In most cases, when it's a bill, we include a copy of the bill if the vendor requires it, or we put an account number on the memo line. But if you would like a letter to be sent along with the check, you would have to supply it to UCP. The only time UCP sends a letter along with a check is in the case of a donation, stating that it's a donation made from a particular account, um, that the tax deduction that was already given to the donors and no need for a tax deduction, excuse me, deductible receipt to be sent to us. Okay. Uh, the next question is, what is the general turnaround for getting reimbursed? Well, typically, once it's received in our offices, so depending on how you send it to us, let's say if you mail it to us, it needs to get mailed to UCP, so a couple of days to get to us. Or let's say you fax or email something, it gets to us pretty much that same day. We take three to five business days to process a, a request or a disbursement. And once that item is processed, 
It's mailed out that same day via first class USPS postal mail. You are able to request same day or next day service uh, processing wise or even priority or wire or FedEx or delivery wise, but typically uh, a piece of mail takes about three to five business days to reach its destination. We are located on the East Coast, right near Washington, D.C. So if you're, let's say, on the East Coast as well, it's probably not going to take as long to get to you as, say, someone on the West Coast or in the Midwest or even in the Northwest. Okay, and I think we just have one more question. Uh, do you prefer to receive invoices from subcontractors an example as webmaster, program design consultant, event helper, so UCP can pay them directly? Yes, we do have to pay taxable income. All those options you just applied to us, those are services. And services do have to be paid directly from UCP to that individual. As we touched upon earlier, we do have to pay that directly because we have to report that income to the IRS as well as give that, in, excuse me, that vendor or individual a 1099 at the end of the year for their taxes. And as we, we talked about earlier, we can't reimburse if you pay someone taxable income for services. We have to pay that directly. Okay, thank you so much, Katie. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule today to present this information. I hope that our attendees were able to get a better understanding on how to request payments, donations, and filling out a disbursement request form. If you do have any questions um, after this presentation, you can go ahead and just email Katie directly, and we'll be glad, or she'll be glad to answer that any of those questions for you. Um, but before we log off here, I also just want to uh, review the past webinars that we do have up on our website um, at unitedcp.org under the Resources tab. And then if you look under educational presentations, um, this, uh, we have a presentation on how to get started with your program at UCP. This presentation is really great for uh, new programs that we have or programs that would kind of like a refresher course on our policies, procedures, and forms. We also have a guide to hosting an event or fundraiser um, video up as well. And we also have future webinars. Um, they typically happen every other month on the third Wednesday of the month is what, is what our goal is. The next one coming up is on July 17th, as Katie mentioned earlier, on the new and updated foreign gifting policy and forms. And that will be at 2 p.m. Uh, the link for that to register will be in tomorrow's newsletter. Uh, so keep your eye out for that if you would like to register for that webinar. And also, we're going to have a webinar on grants and GrantStation, which is an online resource uh, for grant, uh, to search for grants. Um, but we're not sure on the date on that one, so just keep your eye out in the newsletters. We'll, we'll post that up. And also, I just want to mention, um, it will be, in, again, in tomorrow's newsletter, is that we have partnered with GrantStation, um, which is an online resource for finding grants. You'll have access to various uh, tools and different resources to help you become a better grant seeker. Um, and more information will be provided in tomorrow's newsletter. And again, also, if there's any topic you would like to see us cover, just please send your suggestions to me, stephanie at unitedcp.org, and we'll try to accommodate that in a future webinar. All right, thank you everyone for being here today. This webinar was recorded and will be up online. Um, by the end of the week, and you'll find it available in a future newsletter. All right, thank you so much. Have a good day. Bye-bye.